Avocado, I'm not going to hide how hard this letter has been to write because my love for you sinks deep. I've got feelings, guttural, cellular, you are in my bones, and I've got facts. Feelings tip the scales first, so I'll start there. It's as if your cells contain the missing links to my intestinal DNA. As I eat you, I feel like I'm snapping the final piece in a thousand piece puzzle. True satiety. Add carbs, chips, or toast, and all the world's grandmothers just tucked me into bed with sheets still warm from the dryer. A profoundly tender love. This is enough. But a mention of your history that underlines my transcendental love for you. I always knew you were special. Then I discovered that you are very special, an evolutionary anachronism, a scientific miracle. Your seed distribution symbiotically relied on giant sloths and other prehistoric bohemus that could swallow you whole. These beasts became extinct over 13,000 years ago, yet somehow you survived without a co-conspirator for over 5,000 years. Biologists have no explanation for this perseverance. You truly are the immaculate conception fruit, worship worthy. I love you. I'm Jessamine Starr. You're listening to Fruit Love Letters. Food, for me, is a way to express love. I'm a chef in Atlanta, and I fold my feelings into the meals I cook. For my family, my friends, even strangers. It can be hard for me to say, I love you. But you will know it when I serve you roasted radishes nestled in their own greens. But if I peel you an apple, slice you a persimmon, pick you a mulberry with my stained fingers, then we'll both know it's really serious. Fruit, of course, have long been considered symbols of love, even aphrodisiacs. On this show, I'm exploring our love of fruit and what it says about us, people. On this episode, avocado. But there's a twist. I'm actually going to focus on the avocado pit, not the edible fruit. Now, I eat a lot of avocados, and each time I slice a fruit, tap my knife into the pit, twist to dislodge it, then scoop the seed out, I think about what a shame it is to throw away such a big piece of the avocado. I mean, of course, all fruit or most have seeds. Some, like apples, are small. Grape seeds can be a nuisance, while pomegranate seeds dictate the whole eating experience. In berries, the seeds just add a lovely little crunch. There are other fruits whose seeds command attention, like mango or pawpaw. But it was the avocado pit that got me thinking about a seed's worth. We think of seeds as necessary to cultivate life, but they're not often used in commercial fruit growing. So are seeds ultimately trash? Or do they too have a use when it comes to fruit? My exploration got a little conceptual, but let's start on solid footing with this basic question. Do avocado trees grow from seed? We typically don't grow the tree all the way from seed. Okay, that was easy. This is Tom Siddons. I'm an avocado farmer. I own Sleepy Lizard Avocado Farm in South Florida. I asked Tom to explain why we don't grow avocados from seed. After all, just about everyone I know has taken an avocado seed, poked it with toothpicks, and dangled it over water until roots took the promise of a tree. Avocados are very genetically diverse. And as a result, every single seed will produce a unique tree. It's just like human beings. Every baby grows up to be a unique adult, a unique individual. Even siblings who came from the same two parents grow up to be very different. If you've got an avocado tree in your yard with 200 fruit on it right now, there are 200 seeds, one in each of those fruit. Each of those seeds contains a unique set of DNA, and it is going to grow into a unique tree. Now, that's really good for 
survival, right? I mean, every time a new tree grew, it would be different than the ones before it. And the trees that had characteristics favorable to current conditions live. They survive and they survive to breed. But what's best for avocado's survival may not be best for our palates. Once we find that tree we love and we eat the fruit from it, we plant the seed, we have no idea what it's going to be. And most of the time, it's not going to be as good as or better, right? There's like an infinite sort of range of what you can get. Tom says on his property, there's a tree that bears this out. I have a seedling tree out in the backyard. The edge of my yard, not in the grove, but near our house, there's like a wooded area. And I think a squirrel or something must have just took a avocado back there at some point because there's an avocado tree that grew from seed. There's no other avocado trees around it. It's not grafted. In the last 10 years, it gave me fruit four times. Okay. It gave me 100 or so fruit one year. The next year, it gave me 200. The next year, it gave me one fruit. The next year, it gave me two fruit. Two years prior, it gave me nothing. And since then, it's given me nothing. And the fruit is gorgeous. It is so pretty. It's this beautiful, shiny, pear-shaped fruit. But the taste, it's not unappealing, but it's bland. So to avoid this, growers graft their trees to produce the avocados people actually want to eat. To graft is to combine branch or twig from a desirable tree with the roots of a different tree. So you know what it is you're growing to avoid the mystery of infinite diversity. This diversity stems from the avocado's heterogosity. That basically means that the tree grows from seed has inherited different versions of a gene from each of its parents. People are like this, and apples are too. If you haven't heard the apple episode yet, check it out. We discuss it there as well. But Tom says there's another thing that makes avocados super diverse. Avocados do not want to pollinate with other avocado trees of the same variety. There's 900 known varieties. There's actually well into the thousands, but there's 900 acknowledged commonly known varieties of avocado. And none of them like to pollinate within their variety. So a Haas does not like to pollinate a neighboring Haas. I grow Choquettes and Monroes. Choquettes love to pollinate Monroe. Monroe loves to pollinate Choquette. So not only are they heterozygous, which means they carry the genetic content from both parents, but they're getting very diverse genetic content because they do not breed within variety. Tom says the avocados we mostly eat, the Hass, it was a random result of this penchant for new characteristics from seed to seed. It was discovered nearly a century ago. And it's named after its creator, Rudolf Hass. That was a tree grown from seed. He grew a seed in a pot. He planted it in his yard. He tried to use grafting to grow a variety of avocado called Fuerte. Grafts don't always succeed. His graft failed and the tree continued to grow from seed. His daughter and other family members tasted that fruit, decided it tasted good, and he discovered a new variety of fruit. That's called the Hass avocado. Hass and other growers started grafting this one tree's branches so they could grow more and more of it. If you go to your local supermarket, odds are it's Hass avocados on the shelf. And it is pronounced Hass. A lot of people say Hass. Other people say Hass. There's a debate. I got a phone call from Rudolf Hass's grandson telling me specifically how to pronounce his name. It's Hass. If you go to your local supermarket, odds are the avocado you're buying is a Hass avocado because that's 95% of the market. In America, we eat 4 billion Hass avocados a year. And they are all grown from what is genetically the same tree. A tree produces about 200. So there are millions of trees producing Hass avocados, but only one, the original, was grown from seed. The idea of that makes me sad, like we're cutting off the potential for something new, something exciting. 
But Tom says it's not like no one messes with the seeds. Well, there's people all around me here, people who own nurseries and farms who engage in what's called seedling hunting. So they will set aside a portion of their property and they'll just let seeds grow and see what it gives them. And that's not just with avocados, it's with other types of fruit that this concept applies to. And up the street, I have a guy that's a seedling hunter. He's the one that found a red avocado and he named it, he named it Hialeah Red. And he sells a tree now that produces red avocados. Well, if they just took that particular seed and grafted it, it never would have grown into the red avocado. It would have grown into whatever they grafted, right? So what I said earlier about the genetic diversity being good for the survival of the Persia Americana species, but not necessarily the best for the human palate. The other side of that is there's secrets yet to be discovered. There's seeds that haven't even been pollinated yet that at some point are going to pollinate. Someone's going to plant. Someone's going to let them grow. And in 10 years, we will have the next interesting, delicious, what have you avocado variety. And we wouldn't have that were it not for these seedling hunters. Still, that's a very small percentage of the seeds we produce, eating 4 billion avocados per year. Are the rest of these pretty round pits just going to the dump? It turns out not all of them. People have found all sorts of uses for them. Some people make tea out of the seeds. A company called Reveal recently started bottling avocado pit tea. A Colombian textile company called Suhaza uses them to dye their fabrics. The pits make a beautiful pink color. And then I came across an artist that was using avocado pits to rethink our whole world. Hi, my name is Marilena Pombo. I'm an artist in New York City. I think I'm mostly known for my work utilizing avocado seeds, which I have been developing for the past maybe four or five years, something like that. Maria Elena is originally from Venezuela. So I started, when I moved here to New York City in 2011, I moved to study fashion design. And soon after, I started working at Michael Kors as a fashion designer. But around the same time, I discovered by accident, not accident, maybe a coincidence of circumstances that you could dye fabric with different plants. One of these plants were avocado seeds. And I had an avocado tree in my house in Venezuela and... I think this moment really changed something in how I was experiencing this reality of being outside of my country and like, what does that mean? She started to think more about the tree her family once had. The house where it grew had been a joyful, open place. I have this very strong association of the avocados with my home and that house was sold some years ago, maybe like eight years ago or something. And it is a house where there were many gatherings, like for family and friends. Like we would always have these like very huge gatherings and maybe my brother would have some friends and I had some friends and my parents and we would be kind of like coexisting. And this tree was a reminder of all that, not necessarily its fruit, but its presence. Like one of the things with this avocado tree I had back home, it didn't mean that I was eating a lot of avocados. It meant that actually we had to gift avocados to people. These were quite large avocados. So in my house, we couldn't really eat them at the rate that the tree was giving them. So if I would go get a haircut, I would bring some avocados for the hairstylist and the other ones or to a house of friends. And it became like in our group of friends and family, almost like, oh, these are the avocados from La Marimba, which is the name, which was the name of this house. The avocados were a currency of community. Other fruit grew in the house too, but something about the avocados stuck with her, just like it did with me. And slowly, I started to explore this medium. Well, not a medium, a material. Her experiments focused on dyeing textiles with avocado pits. She did that for a while, mostly on weekends and her free time. She designed a collection of garments using the dyed fabric. And then she got so into it, she decided to quit her job. And then I had more time to really explore and understand what this meant. That first year of not having a full-time job and just exploring this, that's when I started actually collaborating with, with restaurants. They started giving me their avocado seeds. That meant that I had a lot of this material. The more avocado pits she collected, and the more she thought about them, the more questions they opened up for her. There used to be giant sloths in South America, and they were eating these avocados and they would eat the seed just the same way that maybe sometimes we eat by accident the seed of a watermelon. 
then they would poop it and then a tree would be <laughs> would grow out of this. And I think that this very simple thing for me started opening so many questions like about where I'm coming from and also how can I explore with history from this region. It tends to be very complicated, especially when you are from South America, because the way colonization happened for us is that most of us that are from that region, we descend from big teams or also victimizers. It's not a one dimensional view. Like I know that I have ancestors that suffer, but also people that inflicted this suffering. So I can't just like choose like, oh yeah, like the Spanish came and did this. No, like they are also my people, unfortunately. Like I, I have to accept both of these things. One of the things she honed in on was Venezuela's current political troubles, which have made many Venezuelans flee the country. Basically, like, Venezuela has this like huge diaspora that it's something that has started in the past like 10, 15 years. Like at this point, around 17% of the population has left and it's quite a new phenomenon. Growing up, no one emigrated. Most of the people from my generation, their grandparents will be foreigners. So this is kind of like a new thing that we're trying to understand. She was thinking about this intellectually, but she was also dealing with it personally. Her own family and friends from Venezuela were scattered across the globe. At the time, a friend was getting married in the Netherlands. A cousin in Spain was receiving her first communion. I want to be there for these people that I love, for these moments that are important for them. I can, in theory, but I can't at the same time because I can't just go to Europe for two months and hang out. So I thought, well, I had already been doing workshops here in New York City, in my studio and in other spaces. So I thought, well, maybe I can organize a series of workshops there and do a sort of avocado tour. She contacted various cultural spaces about doing dyeing workshops. And she asked her contacts in each location to start saving avocado seeds for her. So I was harassing all of my friends and family for several months to please save the avocado seeds that they were eating. And at the beginning, they would forget, but then everyone got super excited about it. And then they were sending me their photos. And even though like we were away, we were kind of playing this game together. When I was doing this avocado tour, I started in the south of Italy, in Calabria, in a small town there. And then I went to Spain, to Madrid, Barcelona, and Coruña, a city in Galicia, and then Berlin. And then the final stop was in Paris. She noticed that in each place, the colors in her dyeing workshops came back different. It was because of the water. And it's something that I already knew, that this happened when you're working with extracting color from plants, that the same way that the water tastes different in different cities and it affects your hair and skin differently, it also will affect the colors on natural dyes. But I think seeing it week after week for two months, and in a context also that I'm having to explain this to people, really made me think that this was something that I could explore even more, especially the last stop was in Paris. The fabric she dyed ran from pale pink to almost magenta. They were a physical representation of something more intangible, distance. I can almost map where my friends and family from Venezuela have gone through these different hues that we have from the avocado seed. When Maria Elena got home to New York, she started asking more people to send her water from their own towns and cities. So at first, all the people that I have harassed for several months in 2017 to save avocado seeds for me, for when I would go do a workshop in their city, I asked them to please send me water with the idea of like mapping this Venezuelan diaspora to actually show all the different places in which we are through these waters. The project grew. Other people that were not Venezuelan heard about it. So I decided to make it a more universal thing and have these two levels, right? That one, that it's more about Venezuelan diaspora and it's one that I would take a longer time to explore because it's quite heavy. It's something that for me, it's, it's very real. I asked Maria Elena how the project made her feel. Day in and day out, handling all these avocado pits, using them to dye fabrics with water sent to her from around the world by her fellow immigrés. There were many people that I would always still speak with, but maybe not that often. And then this meant that every week they would send me an update. I didn't even ask them, but they were always very proud. And they were telling me that they had other friends contributing and I honestly like they were friends that I had been talking but very superficially and then we did this together and now we speak like almost every day because it's almost like reconnected us and I think when you have a sort of excuse 
it makes it more natural to start talking about other things that are more heavy. So we had this excuse. And then we start to talk about, I'm dating this person, or I'm being offered this opportunity, or I miss home. It was a completely different way of consuming the fruit. But just like eating together with friends, it established connections, wired new nostalgic pathways in their minds that lit up with the appearance of an avocado. I remember even crying with some of the fabrics. And I remember thinking, why am I crying? I'm just dyeing some fabric and it's coming in different colors. Like, this is so ridiculous. But it was very emotional. With avocados, she could process the many feelings boiling up inside her. What is it that we miss? And I think in many ways, even realizing, like, maybe I don't necessarily miss a place only, but also the people and also a time. Kind of like accepting... I moved to New York when I was 24, I'm 33 now. And I think for me, sometimes I get confused about, oh, I miss this place, I miss these people. But well, I also wouldn't be doing these things anyways today, some of the things that I miss just because I'm, I'm an older person now. Like I'm not going to be going to parties all the time. And I think I sometimes would lose perspective of this and then maybe talking with other friends or like, well, we also are just older, you know, like that kind of like you have to accept this, that it wouldn't be the same anyways. And I think also having this concreteness of like seeing the different colors and accepting like we are in these different places and the way that we see the world is different, right? Like we are the same, but we are not because we also have assimilated. Her projects with the avocado kept evolving. She couldn't help herself. One thing kept leading to another, one inquiry rolling into the next. All of them somehow connected to Venezuela. Her absence from it, the diaspora, as if the avocado pit, with its genetic material carrying an infinity of possibilities for what it might produce, somehow encapsulated this strange new reality. The million what-ifs once you leave your homeland. Maria Elena started grinding the avocado seeds. It was for storage purposes at first, because she had so many pits from the restaurants that were saving them for her. But... The resulting paste reminded her of a specific beach in Venezuela. I started to have these very intense memories of being like a child in these beaches with this very specific sand and playing with the sand and wondering, like, can I also make things with this? The way that I was making like a sand castle or something when I was little. She started thinking, what if the avocado paste could be a building material? What if it could be fashioned into fabric, a leather, an energy source? What if our whole world rotated around the avocado seed and what we could get from it? What would it look like then? She tried to answer those questions with a project titled La Rentrada, The Re-Entry. The way that I frame this project, I grew up in Venezuela, of course, I already said it, and Venezuela's economy depends on petroleum. And it's something like 96 or 99% of the exports are petroleum. And it's very interesting because... Many things happened there that I had to do projects when I was maybe in fourth grade to talk about petroleum and all the uses for petroleum and like that. I remember being very freaked out that like bubblegum was made with petroleum and then I didn't want to eat bubblegum for a while and it's something that I really like to eat. And then I was really, this is very weird. And like in Caracas, where I grew up, you didn't see the oil fields because there's no oil there. But my mom is from a city where there is oil and the oil is being extracted there and like you are riding your bike around and, and you see the I always forget the name in English. But the oil extraction that they're like a little The wells, I guess. Yes. You see this thing and it's very present and there's been free university for the past like sixty years and it's all subsidized with oil and everything is around it and people in general had a very positive view because it allowed a welfare system that was completely unheard of in the region. But, she says, there's environmental issues around petroleum and societal issues that stem from a singular focus on petroleum in the economy. You can't have an economy that is based on extracting one thing that is finite and it's going to end. And you can't have an economy that depends on one thing. That doesn't make any sense because when that one thing is not valuable anymore for the society, then it's over, which is kind of like, part of the drama of like why there's this huge Venezuelan diaspora today, part. It's not just that, but it is definitely a part of it. And I would have so many of my friends 
And people were like, why avocado again? Why are you obsessed with this? And I was like, well, I have access to it and I'm always going to have access to it. But for me, it started almost like, I don't want to say a joke because it wasn't a joke, like we're going to laugh, ha ha ha. But almost like, well, you see here, this is crazy, but you don't see it in this other context. We can make anything from anything, basically. Like if you really allow yourself to be creative and to try and to experiment, you can have many possibilities. This infinity of possibilities the avocado pit carries to Maria Elena, that went way, way beyond the potential kinds of fruit one might grow. It was a new imagining of society. It requires a very different dynamic, right? It requires that you have to save things and you have to all collaborate together. And it's never going to be something so majestic, but it will be equally meaningful. And it's the complete opposite of petroleum, that it's always very majestic. It's always like skyscrapers and highways and subways, and it's always very flashy. So for me, that's part of it, especially in this context of La Rentrada, which means basically sort of like the re-enter. It's reimagining how this return of the Venezuelan diaspora could be. Like if we all do go back and we are changed, right? Because we have had these years outside and we are going to see things differently. So we are going to see possibilities that maybe before we didn't see. And we ourselves will have gone through the same changes that the avocado seeds went through. You know, like I have to boil the avocado seeds so they gave me color. I have to grind them. Like I have to destroy them. And then they transform into something else. And I feel like I have the past 10 years, I have been boiled and grinded, but still every single time something better has come out. And I feel it's the experience that when I'm talking with people, and in my case, my experience has been one of the easiest ones of the many people that I know, there's still this perseverance that you're being boiled, you're being ground up, and then something incredible comes out of this. So I think it's on that on one level that, but also this idea that we are going to build this thing together in a completely different way. We all have to collaborate and it will not be so flashy, but it might be actually even better. It's just an avocado pit, something we casually toss to get to the fruit itself. But in Maria Elena's hands, it turned into a way to connect with far-flung loved ones, a way to conceive of a better world. I don't think that I could have, like, 10 years ago, decided, like, I'm going to create this body of work about avocados. Like, I think it would have not felt right necessarily. I think I would have felt that it was weird, but I discovered that it had all these material possibilities and there's so many stories around them that it felt like a good metaphor to explore this idea of the house that once was. And, I mean, it's the house, the physical one, the marimba house, but it, it's also the city and the country and a specific moment in time. I did this interview months ago now, but I still think about it often, how the avocado pit is a wonder rich in metaphor. And all it takes is the right set of hands to harness those narratives of possibility and connection. It reminds me of something Tom Siddons, the avocado farmer, told me. Tom was talking about the pit as seed, not as metaphor, But he seemed to have arrived at many of the same connections Maria Elena had. Tom said, the seed is powerful. Like I tell people, before you plant that tree, I want you to just sit down and think about what you're about to do, right? You're connecting the earth to the sun. Like you're literally putting something in the ground with roots that attaches it to the earth. And on the other side are leaves that open up to the sun. (laughs) And you create a machine that takes energy from the sun and nutrients from the earth and produces something that contains energy that people then eat to go on and go about their lives. And you're connecting it to something that takes seven minutes for the light to get here from. To me, it's just really an incredible thing if you really think about the way things are connected. Like we're not just connected to each other, we're not just connected across the planet. When you put a tree in the ground, you're connecting to something way the heck out there in the solar system. So next time you pluck an avocado pit from the fruit, take a minute to think about that. Thanks to Tom Siddons and Maria Elena Pombo. You can subscribe to Fruit Love Letters anywhere you get your podcasts. And we'll be back next week with more Love Letters to Fruit. Fruit Love Letters is part of Whetstone Radio Collective. Thank you to the Fruit Love Letters team, producer Irina Zhorov, 
audio editor, Bethany Sands, researcher, Carolyn Crosby, and intern, Indigo Clarkson. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder, Stephen Satterfeld, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer, Celine Glazier, sound engineer, Max Kodolchek, associate producer, Quentin LeBeau, and sound intern, Simon Lavender. I'm Jessamine Starr. Thanks for listening to Fruit Love Letters. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, at Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more podcast video content. You can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com.